is getting. Right, so 1981, we are talking about, this is one of the last years of Brezhnev's reign, right, which is uh, considered in Russia, or I don't, maybe generally stagnation, sort of, it was a stable time, it was time of my uh, childhood, right, uh, but also, of course, it was, uh, the Soviet Union was not a totalitarian state at this time, but probably uh, better to say an authoritarian state because uh, the freedom of information was under control. People could not travel outside of the country, right? People cannot study what they want. So all those things, they, the way you slice it, they're still like a prison from my end. And of course I have discussions with like a classmate of mine, uh, constant discussions who, who doesn't see it this way actually. So, but uh, I mean, classmate of mine from, from, from back from the Soviet Union, from my school. Um, but uh, Russian Church abroad did this, this amazing thing and probably beautiful thing canonizing uh, new martyrs in 1981. So sort of uh, putting money where uh, her mouse always was, uh, and it was uh, an act of idealism, right? Uh, also, some people were still alive who uh, caught, uh, caught uh, repressions in Russia, like Vasily Ivanovich Alexeyev, whom I was honored to meet, who happened to be uh, at the funerals of St. Patriarch Tikhon. Right, so there were still people like him, and in ten years' time, I don't know to what to say from the providential history. If you try to understand God's passes, God ways, His hand. So, but the, the Soviet regime collapsed in ten years' time in 1980, 1991. So the Russian flag that it was amazing to see this Russian flag in Jordanville in 1988, where you see it every day. So when I came from the Soviet Union, it was really amazing to see this flag, right? But then it became just normal, that's the Russian flag. But it was fly, it, it was uh, flu for the first time in, uh, in uh, 1991 during, uh, during uh, August events, transfiguration events. And, and clergymen of the Russian Church abroad, like uh, for sure there was a test Nikolai Artemov from Munich who spoke from uh, Belly Dome from the uh, house of, of, the, of the ministers of the Russian Federation. He spoke to the people who stood up against uh, butchered, butchered attempt of coup d'etat a butchered attempt to take to take over uh, by communist uh, uh, authority in Russia. So, and sort of Russian Church abroad already was involved with this and involved there in Russia, which also was, uh, in my estimate, a beautiful thing because some of the people, they, uh, they decided to come back to on their words and return to at least uh, homeland of their fathers, if not their own homeland, which is amazing because if you think about Israelites, very few Israelites, they came back to the land that, you know, uh, about what they were weeping, sitting of the uh, shares of the river, river of Babel, right? That's what we think those days. And uh, it's already 1991, but in between 1981, another thing happened that in 1984, on the day of St. Michael, Arch Archangel, and Heavenly Horse, November 21, New Style, Metropolitan Philariat Poznesensky, a very devout man, a pious man, uh, passed away. So he passed away in 1986, a bishop council of the Russian Church abroad elected Metropolitan uh, Vitaly Mustinov. Metropolitan Vitaly Mustinov was born in uh, the Russian Empire 
in 1910. He had strong memories about his childhood and a military family or like the military policeman and something like that. And, and he became uh, a cadet, uh, a military student. He was evacuated with cadets, had a successful uh, life in France. He studied in Lycée in France. He then enlisted in the French army. Then he had some transformation, something that happened to Otec Kiprian Pejov, who is an iconographer. I think both of them, uh, future, the future uh, Metropolitan Vitali and Father Kiprian, they uh, lived in Nice. So, and they very strongly converted, not converted, they very strongly sort of rejected the word, very monastic. And, and for, for future Father Vitali, he came to, uh, to the mothership of our monastery, to the uh, monastery in Ladamirova. So he was ordained by Metropolitan Anastasi in 1939, 1940. Monks there, they ministered to the local population. They were very, very, very connected with local people. They, 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 it was a missionary idea of the monastery, something that Jordan released. It's not just, uh, it's not just monastic place of seclusion from the world. It's more, that's why the seminary here, and it's important to understand the monastery delivers food for the table. The monastery actually sets the seminary up. So there may be, uh, so uh, therefore, it's something that comes frostly from the monastery. And then it's, it's the seminary is not, and not a thing for better or for worse. It's not a thing that exists on, on its own, right? It's still an, an offshoot of, this, of the monastery. So, and somehow it's connected with the Sladomirova monastery. Uh, and Vladika Vitali was loved uh, as a priest, local priest. Uh, uh, he was the one actually who was sent to retrieve uh, future uh, Atiyat's floor and uh, Atiyat's lover uh, from Ladamiro when Brotherhood left uh, going to the west from this advanced Soviet army. He did a lot for uh, saving people from sending back to the Soviet Union and North Germany with Father Nafanael. Sort of, uh, he was an English speaker, so he didn't have any problem defending the Russians from the British uh, military police and speaking to them, explaining to them what's going on. So I, I, I would like to believe that many uh, fallacies of his were forgiven because of that, all right? But the same thing as Metropolitan Philoria that I would like to mention that hasn't been mentioned, he didn't have any formal theological education, okay? And I do think that this backfired Right, he was he was a pious Russian man, a very strong believer. He had almost like absolute faith, if, if I'm allowed to speak about this. A friend of mine talked to him, and he brought it up that uh, Vladika, what would you do if you found yourself, if you would find yourself like in in the Soviet Gulag, and there would people who were about like to violate you, to do terrible things to you. And he would say, I would pray to God and nothing would happen to me. Well, some, some might say that this is too much, but maybe, maybe that's, that's how his face was, you know, who knows who, who is able to speak about this. So he became, he became our first hierarch in 1986. And he immediately demonstrated that he was a very decisive man because he uh, ordered investigation into Holy Transfiguration Monastery in Brookline, uh, Massachusetts. They joined us in 1965 as a matter of protest again, against uh, ecumenical abuses, uh, as they saw it from uh, Patriarch of Inagoros. They were received without canonical releases. And apparently there were numbers of complaints about their ascetic practices sort of how their ascetic practices were connected with things that uh, can also be uh, uh, seen as homosexuality, okay? So, uh, and, uh, and there were people who were traumatized as a result of this. But 
soon after this investigation was ordered, Holy Transfiguration Monastery mentioned that Russian Church abroad starting to change the traditional course. Russian Church abroad started uh, to become uh, less strict about orthodoxy, and they left Russian Church abroad for an old calendar synod. The same thing also was, was ordered regarding Russian ecclesiastical mission to have a, a thoroughful revision there. And also Father jo Bishop jo Gregory Grabe lost his position in the Synod of Bishops. Now, this was new course. And when uh, Bishop Pilarion was invited, uh, I mean, he was invited in 1984 uh, and became a bishop uh, by still under Metropolitan Philariot, but he found himself basically in, a, in, in an empty house and seen it because like <laughs> everyone sort of left. Or, so, uh, and uh, Metropolitan Vitali, he was one of our uh, hierarchs, first hierarchs who had uh, uh, a very, a very distinct writing style. Just he, he, he beautifully uh, wrote in Russian Right, uh, he he similarly to Metropolitan Anthony, very uh, maybe overly idealized Russia. He really kind of he was, uh, I he 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 didn't want to uh, he didn't he didn't want I, I, how how I put it. Uh, I mean, he didn't work as a historian. That's how I would like to put it. He didn't really uh, match one set of facts against another set of facts, seeing basically what uh, facts uh, back up uh, and what facts uh, trustworthy and what uh, were not trustworthy. And also, uh, do we always were on the right side? Do we always uh, uh, were 100%? Was it possible for us or not for, for anyone else to be 100% right all the time? and so on. Um, and uh, uh, under during his time, during his time, there was the last event that unified all Russian, uh, Russian, uh, all, all diaspora of the Russian background, right? I mean, of the Russian Orthodox background, that's what I would like to say. Uh, the millennium, millennium of Russian Orthodoxy that wasn't really uh, uh, celebrated fully in the Soviet Union. It was allowed, but it's allowed as a cultural event, mostly. That's a, so, how Soviet authority wanted to, to sell it as a sort of starting point for Russian culture. For, But on contrary, of course, in the diaspora, there was strong urge to emphasize Christianity, to emphasize that it's church, to emphasize what is dear to all of us, church people, right? So, uh, and uh, a big uh, point was a consecration of the bell tower, Jordanilski Karandash. So that <laughs> you guys don't need to travel long distance to see this. Right. <laughs> okay, so you can come and give it a hug. So give it a, give your bell tower a hug. Okay, so. And then I may get some questions what, I, what I've been doing with this class. So. <laughs> well, must be, uh, in our library, we still have uh, brochures of uh, this celebration, like very yes. big pamphlets that you can see. Yeah, you, you, mean they, they, you mean you have them in numbers, that's what you mean. Or you, you, you mean you have just single copy, or you mean there are stacks, there are still stacks of those brochures? Oh, no, no, no. Well, maybe we have in archive stacks, but we definitely have some of the copies in the public library. Right, it was the last event that, that united, that united, uh, that united Russian diaspora, and also united, like uh, I remember on the east side in New York, there were huge banners, thousand years of, uh, of baptism of Ukraine. So, some people made their points. No, it was Ukraine that was baptized. So here we go, right? So those topics. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Right. Uh, and uh, people donated. You, 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 you guys, all of you, I believe, saw those bells that were uh, back then. It wasn't like now you can order them from Russia. Well, the Kaloros traveled maybe once or maybe twice 
to uh, Belgium, right, to observe them. They were done in Belgium. I think they were done in Malin, if I'm not mistaken. Actually, Malina was sworn that's from Malin. It's not from us, nothing else. Because bells, they came from the west to Byzantium, and then they became. That's how history is. Something comes like Manti became Russian Pilmeni. Okay, and it's totally normal, but that's how history is, right? You cannot really claim this. Listen, Pilmeni is the most Russian food. Wait a minute, okay? Well, we, we have also Manti, I believe. It's like bigger Pilmeni. So yeah. Pilmenia Yes, but I mean, I'm, I'm using the, what, what this uh, like uh, historical, what, yeah. I mean, you order in Chinese buffet, there is, I mean, we understand what I'm talking about. So, I, 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 name is clear. But, but that's what I'm saying. Everything travels around and so on. And same is true for Bell, Bell ringing, which big rich. West, West is not really famous about, about Bell ringing, I guess. Maybe I'm mistaken. But a sort of it's, it became a very strong part of the Eastern Orthodox ethos. So they were ordered there, delivered here. Uh, families donated, like I think the Perikrostov bell is there. So uh, uh, Mikhail Petrovich, mom and dad, I think they donated funds to, to have this bell. So it kind of was really united. And nothing on this scale, I believe, happened since then, since 1988, because then the Iron Curtain col uh, collapsed. So books started to be printed in Russia on a huge scale. They basically outdone Jordan Wheel. Jordan Wheel went out of business because of the Russian printing and publication, because sort of everything now is done in Russia. So we don't, re we don't really have resources for this. Uh, and uh, in, 99, in, 90, in the late 1980s, people from Russia started to petition who uh, had experience with the Russian Church abroad. They, they wanted Russian Church abroad to have a representation uh, in uh, Moscow, to have a representative, because they really like this Damashny, uh, how would you say, this uh, in, intimate, intimate feeling of the Russian church abroad that basically uh, people very close, so bishops know their flock. And so they really, they wanted to export it. They wanted to have something like that in Russia. So uh, they petitioned our synod to have uh, a Metohian, to have Podvoria in Moscow. And in January of 1990, bishops, uh, they discussed this and they said, no, cannot go there, we don't really understand what's going on, we don't understand grounds very well, we should steer away from this. So, uh, and also there was uh, a catacomb bishop of the Russian church abroad who was secretly, secretly consecrated in 1982 in Moscow. And he was a catacomb bishops, uh, bishop under you know, the Amaphorian of Russian church abroad. And that's also was uh, something that uh, if you start right now uh, actively involved with Moscow Patriarchate, as Moscow Patriarchate invited, like invited to send represent, representative to celebrations of 1988 and so on, what about this track? What about this division, Catacomb Church? Uh, not division, what about this development? Uh, what, so shall we just give up on this? Because we already invested in this before. So, uh, in, 19, in 1990, during uh, Great Lent on Passion Week, an archimandrite from Suzdal contacted Metropolitan Vitali and asked him uh, to be that and asked Metropolitan Vitali to be received under his amaphorian. And Metropolitan Vitali contacted in very, very urgent for, uh, fashion all his peers, his bishops, and they changed decisions through those telephone calls. Of, of the previous synod in January of 1990, not to uh, accept, uh, not to, to get involved openly in, in the Soviet Union. So uh, that's how Archimandrit Valentin Rusansov was received in the Russian church abroad. Next year, he was consecrated in the uh, Memorial Church in Brussels. He was consecrated a bishop, right? And then a few years later, he left Russian church abroad uh, so, and I think later he was anathematized, I believe, by the Church of Russia. So, uh, and on one hand, Russian Church abroad 
wanted to go back to Russia and help those processes that were happening and that Russian church abroad always dreamt about that people come back to uh, to the face in huge numbers. Uh, books now can be freely distributed and so on. How come that we call yourself a Russian church, we call, we, we call ourselves uh, part of the Russian church and we would steer away from all those important things. But, but all historical previous background, all, all baggage that Russian church brought had made this return in the way it, it has been done, sort of through receiving parishes. And people in, uh, people in uh, church people in Russia, they were very grateful to Russian church abroad for what Jordan will been doing day and night, day and night, those presses work. Sort of people were taking shifts and they were printed and printed and printed and stacked those things for future Russia. They really had very strong belief in the resurrection of Russia. So, and then those things started to be sent out. So, they, so every day there were loads, loads of cars going to post office, sending things away from Jordanville. Plus, before they were smuggled out, uh, I mean, smuggled in the Soviet Union before when there was Iron Curtain. So, uh, naturally, people were grateful. Some, there are many people, I think, right now who would say, basically, I grew up on Jordanville literature. And Law of God by Atiyah uh, Serafim Slobodskoy became a super bestseller. Super bestseller. That's, uh, millions of millions of, of copies were printed because nothing like that existed. And it became very successful edition, sort of like Timothy's Ware, Orthodox Church, became a super succession, successful edition, exposition of uh, Orthodox Church. And there are many other attempts, but not, nothing still comes close to Callistus were book. So, and uh, Father Serafim Slobodskoy was a similar. But then, when Russian Church abroad started to receive uh, parishes in Russia, those people, they were bewildered, they, they, they were perplexed. What do you say to us? Basically, you're saying that we are not Orthodox. If you need to have your own parishes here, why our parishes are not good enough? Why do we need to have? An American church, and also that was surprised that some people in Jordanville they used to say that you know we need to go like I mean uh, we need to print leaflets about our church and put them in every mailbox in Russia. The kind of you know just people don't have information, but interestingly for many people it was an American church. Okay, so I would like to stop on this point. I am two minutes uh, out of your time, uh, uh, over your time. And uh, so we just uh, ask uh, Brad uh, Ivan, there is no the only human face I'm seeing today.